Let's look at a shocking property prediction. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because I thought we'd have a look at a prediction about Australian property. We haven't had a real a national real estate boom. No, we haven't. Apparently not. And we're about to get one. Real estate is about to boom. So I thought we'd have a look at this opinion from an expert in the game and then maybe ask a few questions. Because, well, there are some scenarios where property could boom in Australia, but I don't think it's going to be the outcome that everyone is hoping for. You know, you've got a few camps now. You've got some that are saying we're going to have property deflation, some that are saying we're going to have property booming, and others are arguing, well, you know, maybe we'll have a flight into real goods because of hyperinflation. Could housing be one of those goods? That's the question I'll put to you. So I thought we'd have a look at this article from Property Observer, a completely you know, not, uh, unbiased publication, of course, by Terry Ryder, you know, one of their observers. And he actually happens to be from Hot Spotting. I didn't, I by chance, when I happened to capture this website, because I always capture, image capture all of the websites when I'm drawing over them, just so I have a record in case things change, which sometimes they do. And he happens to be an advertiser too, and this is a Google ad, so it's just you know quite convenient. So let's have a look at Terry's, well, his business, his website here. So you can see here, he's, you know, the number one independent real estate analyst here in Australia. So he's tied up in a property. I, I would, I would, you know, put a good, better good carton that property is very important to him. He's built his, you know, his empire and his reputation. So he's going to have a vested interest in it. So maybe he will lean towards a more, well, you know, positive aspect towards property and quite critical of those that are maybe raining on the parade. You know, is that fair? I think that's a fair statement to put. Now you can get started. He's got reports. You can join all this stuff, one-on-one -on -one meetings, all of these things. I mean, you know, good on him. He's got a business. He's plugging his thing. But let's have a look at the argument that he's putting forward because there are a few questions I have. I have about it. So Australia is on the cusp of a national real estate boom, everyone. And I do emphasize national because... Well, apparently, apparently, and I'm, I'm just finding my chart here, you know, the property price growth that we've seen, that we've seen what, in the last 15 years, that, 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 that hasn't been a boom. It hasn't been a boom. Okay. So we haven't had a genuine national real estate boom in Australia since one from, two, from the one from 2001 to 2004, when all the major markets experienced strong price rises. Okay, so that's even before the chart begins here. So this isn't a boom, apparently. It's not a boom. So the one that drove Sydney and Melbourne, prices higher from 13 to 17, was not a nationwide phenomena. As few other locations around the nations shared the price uplift. And in some ways that is, well, for me, that was a bloody good thing because it means I could actually afford to get into a house here in Brisbane for a reasonable amount of money for a, a loan where it's not too onerous. But right now, forces are building, which will generate growth in most major cities and towns across the nation. They will be boosted by new events, which will energize economies, including infrastructure spending and increased activity in the resource sector. Okay, so he's asking, he's talking about infrastructure spending, and we've seen that in the budget. About $7.5 billion the government is putting on infrastructure spending. And we looked at that in a video the other day. The other day. But just think about it. $7.5 billion in, in infrastructure and then some increased activity in the resource sector as well. And he's arguing that that is going to be one point to fuel a boom. To fuel a boom. Now, we, here's the question. Here's the question. You've got the you know, infrastructure, sure, infrastructure spending, that will fuel demand for, for property, probably around the infrastructure. It may open up additional areas where people could commute, so you might have more development there, more property going there. But there are a few things that are going on as well. There's another part of the economy that is not doing as well. Our tourism sector. Our tourism sector. It's $60.8 billion of GDP. So remember, we're throwing 7.5 billion to energize these infrastructure sectors, but tourism is completely smashed. 
it's smashed. So you're going to have all of the properties that are servicing tourism and then all of the houses that are using people are using for Airbnb to make extra money are going to start coming onto the market. So that would have to have be a counterweight. So you got here, you got in infrastructure pushing it up, pushing it up. So, you know, a good friend, Terry, he's saying infrastructure, you know, it's going to push it up. But he, I'd, I'd counter that with, well, look at tourism. Tourism is just taking a hammering. International tourism is non-existent. It's non-existent. Interstate tourism, I mean, come on, it's a mission to do it. It's closed too. Then we have another consideration. International education. All of the international students coming over. And, well, I thought I'd have a look to see how much, what, what the actual, how, well, the impact of international students uh, have on the economy. So this is a report from 2014-15, and it's still relevant today. Because we can just use the figures here. The value of international education exports. So it's considered an export. So in 2014-15, the ABS valued exports from international education at $18.8 billion, making it Australia's third largest export. The analyst presented in this report builds on this figure by examining, you know, all the other avenues. And I will link to this if you want to go through it on your own. But let's just say for the argument's sake that we've got 16, oh, sorry, 18.8 billion there in tourism. Oh, sorry, in international education. Combine that with the tourist industry, that's what, 16.8. So we're looking at roughly 80 billion, 80 billion reduction in two sectors that can have an influence on property. International students, guys, they're driving demand for inner city apartments, for student accommodation, even for housing around universities. You know, the good old share houses. And I mean, even in my area here, where I live, there's a lot of international students. That's going to affect the property prices. It's going to affect the property prices, unfortunately. So those are going to be two anchors that I would say might have a, a, a counter-narrative uh, counter narrative impact compared to what Terry here is saying, where he's arguing that it's going to be a you know, real estate boom. Can we have a boom just from some infrastructure spending when you're going to take a hit? When, you, well, when we've taken a hit in international students, which is dro driving demand for a lot of investment buildings investment products when you've got you've got uh, tourism in the gutter so we're seeing the market getting flooded with you know airbnb and other tourist um other to uh, houses and properties that are being used to service tourism you are you getting properties also shift over into the rental market so the yield that people can make from rentals and i know that's not the most important thing but still still it has to be considered and then we also have all of these uh, moratoriums keep saying memorandums and other all these rental moratoriums where you can't kick out a bad renter that has to really you know put a put a dampener on your strategy to use that to offset the cost of investing in those properties can the capital gain keep going so he's arguing here for something that's probably about 7.5 billion dollars a tenth of what we're losing can we have a boom i mean hey there's also, counter to that as well, supporting his argument is that you've got all the government intervention. You've got a grant here, you've got a grant there, you've got a house maker, house big, you know, house um, home builder, all of these things. Home builder will run out though. It, it has to happen this side of Christmas, guys. You've got to get your contract signed. I'm seeing the metric on signs as I'm driving up from the Gold Coast going, you know, fast sign, contract, you know, boom, boom, boom. That's also putting downward pressure on existing houses. So... We currently have a remarkably strong situation with markets across Australia everywhere, in fact, except the two biggest cities, which are so often the exception rather than the rule. The new price data from CoreLogic suggests that all capital cities except Sydney and Melbourne had price growth in September, while most regional market jurisdictions also recorded growth. The September figures continued the stubborn performance of markets since February when the pandemic first started to impact Australia. But this is the thing. We've got intervention in the market. You've got mortgage holidays, guys. Mortgage holidays that are being stretched out longer and longer. You've got the banks being encouraged to, <laughs> to lend money to businesses and they're chucking all the rules out the window. The RBA is pushing them to do it. Their, their responsible lending requirements are just being thrown away. No one cares. You've got businesses that can trade while insolvent. Okay? And so right now... Every, we're in this kind of weird twilight zone where we're in a recession where people are starting to kind of feel it, but they're not really feeling it. Our savings have gone up, everyone. 
people's savings have gone up. So, many of our capital cities have recorded some level of house price growth. Since February, Canberra has had growth in each of the past seven months. And Adelaide has had uplift in six of the seven months. Yes, but we're not going to see the impact of this for about another year. For about another year or two. This isn't going to be quick. I mean, but the thing is, what else? I mean, what if we do get price growth? You know, and they're right. And they're going, all oh, the doomsayers are wrong. But then everything else costs more. I just, I just did some sums. I had a look at what a house cost in Melbourne. You know, house cost in Melbourne back in 1980 was, what, 30 grand. A loaf of bread back then, 50 cents. 50 cents. What's a house in Melbourne now? You know, 680,000, give or take. What's a loaf of bread? So we'll do the sums. We'll do the sums. So how many? We need the loaf of bread index. So I'll do 680 divided by $2.50. Now you need 27,000, or sorry, 272,000 loaves of bread to buy a house in Melbourne, where in the 80s you only needed 60,000 loaves of bread. And, th and you've got to remember, I'm sure our bread production technology has reached heights of sophistication and advancement in that time. Maybe we need the bread index, the bread, bread to housing ratio. Anyway, People, people don't seem to think about that, do they? Oh, they don't see it like that. It's just because it's so, so slow and so long. So regional markets around Australia are pumping strongly with vacancies ultra low, rents rising and buyers outnumbering sellers. People at the call face of these markets, including buyers, agents, valuers and selling agents have been reporting very competitive markets for several months and the data supports those views. Yeah, but is that because people are trying to get out of the cities? Are they trying to get out of the cities? So I would argue that significant sections of the nation already have notable, not, notable up cycles underway, particularly those where the virus has been under control early. Local economies are strong. Consumer confidence is good. Vacancies are low. First home buyers are active. And the exodus to affordable lifestyle is having an impact. See, that could be, it could be right there. But look at, uh, at other locations over in WA, the Miranda. Did I get it, did I get it right? <laughs> did I get it right? I probably butchered it. Again, uh, some of the suburbs there. Hang on, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'll find that. That video I did, where just the number of properties for sale there are just crazy. How can, I mean, maybe that's just a, a area that we don't need to worry about, guys. You know? Uh, the man, Mandra, warning that I published in a video. I'll just bring it up here. Yeah. There where we looked at just the number of the number of properties that are going for sale, guys. It's crazy. They're flooding it left, right and center. How can you argue? How can you argue that, you know, times are good? We can see here it's a satellite city south of Perth. And apparently you don't pronounce the U for some reason. It's, it's a West Australian dialect. You know, I mean, they, they want to secede from Australia. They kind of screw us all, to be honest. If Western Australia left the Federation, we'd be in a lot of trouble. So let, let's, not, let, let's not encourage that. But you can't say they're having good times there. Their, their values are falling. Property is going down. So much is flooding the market. So... Of the 15 major market jurisdictions in Australia, eight capital cities and seven states or territory regions, uh, 11 have had house prices higher than the start of 2020, led by regional Tasmania, Darwin, as well as Hobart, Canberra, regional New South Wales, and regional South Australia, all up 4 to 5% since the start of the year. 12 of the 15 jurisdictions have house prices higher than a year ago. For apartments, 11 of the 15 locations have highs, have prices higher than a year ago. This means there is a groundswell of positive factors, a rising tide of markets, particularly outside the two biggest cities, which is where two-thirds of Australians live. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, is it going to continue? Is it going to continue? Do you trust the data? Against the backdrop, there are positive forces building which will turbocharge the situation and create a national property boom. We've seen that local economies and, pro economies and property markets have char uh, charged out of lockdown phases with considerable exuberance. We can also get a message from New Zealand, 
where the economies have con has continued to emit positive signals and property prices have been rising strongly across the country. The more our local economies return to normal, with Melbourne recovering and state border restrictions easing, the more we will see an see improved confidence and rising market activity. But the big looming factor is the upcoming infrastructure spending, and partly as a byproduct, considerable uplift in the resource sectors too. We're talking 7.5 billion when we've already identified 80 billion that's going to get hammered. Say only half of that tourism gets hammered. 40 billion. Half of tourism and, and university students, even though university students are down 60%. How's 7.5 billion in infrastructure going to offset that? Can, can you... Can you let me know? So it's clear the federal and state governments intend to generate an infrastructure-led economic recovery and are willing to go deep into budget deficits to achieve it. So here, this is the thing. This is the thing. Will this be real, real increase in purchasing power or we is it just going to be an inflation? And will it be just a flight into real goods? So people are going to be afraid of inflation. So are they going to go into real goods? Are they going to be afraid of inflation overseas? So they're going to go into real goods. Will you, you see foreign money coming into Australia? Are they going to make it easier for people to invest in Australia, to get into housing here in Australia? Few things supercharge economies and real estate markets like big infrastructure projects, be they motorways, rail links, hospitals, or energy facilities. I mean then, okay, here's the question. Right now, we have a real estate sector which is not affordable to the average person where now you can't have a normal person raising a family and maintaining a household on one income. You, you just can't. You have to make a whole lot of sacrifices to do it. Is it, well, is it morally fair and ethical for the government to be putting financial burden on future generations to perpetuate this property bubble? So the people who can't afford to get into it, can't reap any of the benefits, are going to be the ones who are straddled with the burden, the $1.1 trillion of, of you know, government debt. So I was talking to a gentleman today, this morning, when I took the kids to swimming. He, he you know, educated, professional, worked at university, wasn't that interested in the budget, didn't understand it. You know, I mean, that, that's I, I, maybe maybe it's just me. I'm, a, you know, a politics nerd. But I mean, it's pretty, pretty, pretty bloody big news, isn't it? <laughs> so in, infrastructure developments create uh, economic activity and jobs and the energy and that energizes property markets. These projects also improve the amenity of the locations that are directly impacted by the new projects. A byproduct of the infrastructure inspired recovery will be a new resource boom. With that sector already busy servicing overseas demand. Another big factor which will drive prices higher is the extraordinary shortage of real estate in most locations in Australia. Vacancy rates of 1% and, and lower are the norm now and it's putting upward pressure on rents. Developers, well see this is contrary to all the other stuff we're hearing. We're hearing uh, vacancy rates are going up, properties are flooding the market. See this is, we're getting mixed messages from all different sides. Developers have been building less in the past two to three years and investors have been largely on the sidelines for the past 18 months in particular. The rental stock and market needs has not been created at the required level. Well, the market's flooded with properties. Just look at South, the, South Brisbane, all the apartment buildings that have shot up. The, uh, how many of them are empty? How many of them are empty? At the same time, vendors have been resident which means that buyers outnumber sellers in many locations. Recently, we've seen economists from the major banks and other institutions recanting their March-April forecast of real estate prices dropping 10, 20 or 30 percent and are now suggesting much more moderate outcomes. Westpac is now predicting boom level price growth starting in mid-2021. Yeah, I mean, they're predicting Brisbane, where I live, will be up 20 percent. Will be up 20 percent. I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do I want my property to go up 20%? Of course I do. You know, I want to feel like I'm a property genius. You know, 20%. I've, I've already, according to the bank, I've already made a huge profit on my house. Compared to working, it's a lot easier. But do I want my children to be in a situation where, well, 
a house compared to income is so high, they've got even less chance of getting into the market. Do I want Brisbane to be like Sydney? Maybe we just need to, well, we are designing our house to ensure we can have them living here for some time. It's going to be hard with the, with the number we've, we've got. You know, while they and others are becoming increasingly bullish for their predictions, they're still getting it wrong. Prices may be nudging downward, generally speaking, in Melbourne and Sydney, but they are rising in most other places. And the big up, uplift will come much sooner than the economists expect. We're starting to see media reacting to the change in sentiment, although well behind the game as usual. Here are some of the headlines from the past week. Top end of housing market will lead recovery in the Australian. Housing bears face extinction as forecasts term bullish. Financial review. Regional house price rise on the way. Financial review. House price bounce in September. Houses emerge stronger over September as Sydney and Melbourne declines soften. Are we nearing another? Are we nearing another property boom? Victoria set for big summer of sales post lockdown. Well, if they'll get out of the lockdown, huge signs the property market is heading up again. Yahoo Finance. This is significant because mainstream media is reluctant. To <laughs> what the? Oh, oh, Terry, you got me there, mate. You got me there. Oh. Oh, bloody hell. Blood oh, oh. This is significant because mainstream media is reluctant to present positive scenarios about the housing market. Oh, bullshit. Come on. Oh, wow. Wow. I note that um, Simon Presley of Prop Propertyology, who I think is the best real estate analyst in Australia, is also predicting a property boom. He writes in a report published last week, make no mistake, property markets in large parts of Australia will be booming by, sub, uh, by summer. Several locations in different parts of the country have already produced double digit capital growth over the first nine months of this calendar year, and there are umpteen others with fast growing momentum. Anecdotal evidence suggests from research conducted by Propertyology that property markets are already booming in locations such as Newsa, Canberra, Orange, Dubbo, Burnie, Bendigo, Mildura. See, West Australians, you say the bloody you. You did a stupid language over there. Uh, Mount, Gam Mount Gambia. Watch my other video, guys, and you'll see all the comments there, there slamming me. Mount Gambia, Coffs Harbour, and Caratha. That's 10 towns in seven states and territories. The cast of thousands who, during the March-April national lockdown, were forecasting a real estate Armageddon score an epic fail. An epic fail. Well... What do you think, everyone? Do you think the mainstream media doesn't is reluctant to present a positive? Oh, come on. He can't believe that. Maybe he's doing it just to... He's putting it in there. He knows what he's doing. He's putting it in there to piss everyone off so they'll just start sharing it and twitting about it so we'll get more traffic. I mean, good on you. Know, smart. He knows what he's doing. What do you think, everyone? Do you think an infrastructure boom worth a tenth of industry... A tenth? of two sectors which have been hammered and are not predicted to recover for some time will fuel a property boom. I'm not as confident as Terry about that one. We'll have to see. Do you think the huge spikes that they're seeing in regional towns, maybe with people fleeing the cities, do you think that's sustainable? What happened to some of the mining towns in Queensland? Remember Marambar when the property were just flying to the moon? What happened to that? Anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and want to support the content I created, there are a few ways you can. You can join the channel on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or KuCoin. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, or support us via PayPal. Take care, guys. I'll see you all next time.